Good morning, members. So I'm called this, I'll call this virtual meeting of State Government Finance and Elections Committee to order um, for today, March, uh, April 6, 2021. And pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, Representative Elkins, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? Oh, I'll re Wait a second, I gotta, I gotta do the, the roll call. Rep Mm -hmm. Brett, can you take the roll? Chair Nelson? I'm here. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson present. Representative Nash? Good morning. Representative Bonner? Present. Representative Draskowski? Present. Representative Elkins? Present. Representative Greenman? Present. Representative Cleborn? Present. Representative Kosnick? Present. Representative Mason, Representative New Brindley, present. Representative Pulowski, Pulowski present. Representative Quam, present. A quorum is present. Thank you, Ms. Spreck. Uh, now, Representative Elkins, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have them open in front of me and I'm pleased to uh, move the minutes of the March 25th meeting for approval. Uh, the, move, the minutes have been moved for the previous meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Um, the first order of business today is we have the final, um, I believe it's the final um, governor's appointment to the Campaign Finance and Disclosure Board. Um, Mr. Sigurdsson, uh, if you want to introduce yourself, then you can introduce the, uh, the appointee. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, committee members. My name is Jeff Sigurdsson. I'm the executive director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. Um, since we were back here just about a month ago looking at other appointments to the board, I'll just briefly remind you that the board is an independent agency. The governor's office includes our agency in the governor's overall budget, but we do not report to the governor's office. <clears throat> As the chair stated, the uh, initial appointments to the board are made by the governor. The board consists of six members, no more of half of which can be with any particular party. Uh, two members must be former members of the legislature, again, representing different political parties. Uh, the committee previously held the appoint, uh, or heard the appointments of Peggy Lepic, Carol Flynn, Steve Swanson, and, and Ferris Rashid. Uh, Mr. Sowell is here uh, as the fifth of the six confirmations that you'll be hearing this year. Um, so five of the six members are before you and before the Senate as well. Although this doesn't apply to this particular appointment, the other appointments have to be confirmed within 45 days of when they were appointed by a three-fifths vote of both the House and the Senate. Uh, I will remind members that without at least four members, uh, uh, board members, it's the board cannot hold a meeting. Therefore, it's impossible for the board to go forward and finish either an investigation or start an investigation of a complaint as filed with it. Staff can do administrative duties but the investigation, the investigative authority of the board is, does, resist, uh, does rest with the board members. Thank you. And with that, I'll move the appointment of uh, George Sowell. And uh, Representative Klauski, you have your hand up. Did you have a question or? You're, you're, you're muted, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see my hand up, but. I, okay. I'm, Oh, I'm sorry. That was my, my cursor there. It looked like a hand up. Sorry about that. That's um, all right. Mr. Soule, if you want to introduce yourself and uh, um, proceed with, uh, and then we'll get to questions. Mr. Soule. Thank, thank you, Chair Nelson and committee members. My name is George Soule. I live in Minneapolis. I was raised in Becker and Clay counties. My mother grew up on the White Earth Reservation, and I am a member of the White Earth Nation. I graduated Moorhead State and I went to law school. I returned to Minneapolis uh, almost 42 years ago and where I've been a lawyer during that entire period of time. I'm a civil litigation lawyer. That means I mostly defend lawsuits uh, brought against my clients. And I've tried cases in Minnesota and in 18 other states. I also serve as a tribal court judge on the court of, courts of appeals for four tribes in Minnesota, including my own, the White Earth Nation. 
I was a nerd uh, growing up and I liked politics. I guess that's the definition of nerd. And uh, so I got involved in politics really when I was in high school in Moorhead. And I've been involved in campaigns for 50 years. Uh, when I returned from law school in 1980, I became the Minnesota coordinator of the John Anderson for President campaign. Those of you who are old enough to remember that. Recall that he started as a Republican candidate for president and then ran as an independent in the general election. I've also worked on my wife's campaigns. Uh, she was a politician in the city of Minneapolis, served on the city council, and ran for mayor in 2001. For the last 25 years, though, I've focused uh, more on uh, judicial campaigns. I've helped judges who are running for election uh, run their campaigns, and I've uh, chaired a number of campaigns, including for Supreme Court judges. They're listed on my resume. Uh, I've also served as treasurer for two campaigns, neither of which are under the purview of the Campaign Finance Board. One was a federal campaign for Congress in 2006, and the other uh, was for city council in the city of Minneapolis, but I do have experience as a campaign treasurer. I consider myself an independent. I used to be a partisan. I'm far less so as I've grown older. And uh, I would take a nonpartisan approach uh, to the issues that come before the board. I would apply the law to the facts that are uh, revealed during the investigations and try to be fair and impartial and empathetic and uh, considerate of people who make innocent mistakes who aren't uh, professionals in this business. Uh, so I would apply kind of the nonpartisan approach that I used as chair of the Commission on Judicial Selection under Governor Ventura and as a tribal court judge to address the matters that come before the board. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And just I. I thought I moved it, but I'll move the appointment of George Soule to the Minnesota Campaign and Finance Board. Um, members, any questions? It's a quiet bunch this morning. Um, if there are no questions, um, I will move to recommend the confirmation of George Soule to the appointment of the Minnesota Campaign Finance and Dis Public Disclosure Board. Um, Ms. Spreck, do you want to take the roll? Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner? Aye. Representative Drazkowski? Aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, mm -hmm. aye. Representative Kwong? Representative Kwong. With a vote of 12 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. Motion prevails. Congratulations, Mr. Sowell. You're on your way to confirmation. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members. With that, members, the next uh, order of business we have is the walkthrough of the DE amendment for House File 1952, which will be our, M, our uh, omnibus uh, governments, our state government finance, um, omnibus finance bill. Um, members with, I will hand the chair, I will hand it over to Mr. S Mr. Gehring to walk us through the amendment and then we can have some questions and uh, Ms. Rob Ms. Roberts can give us the financial analyst of the analysis of it also. Mr. Gehring. Uh, Mr. Chair, actually, um, Ms. Roberts, I think we'll probably go first because the first article of the DE amendment is the appropriations article. Okay, Mr. Gehring. Ms. Ms. Roberts. Members, can you hear me okay? You're a little quiet. Ah, okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'll try to speak up. 
Um, so um, what I'm going to walk you through is the change item spreadsheet for the um, DE amendment. Um, Typically, we would walk through the more detailed spreadsheet, and I know members have it available to them if they have any questions, but um, given that we're doing this in a Zoom environment, I thought this would probably work better. So what this spreadsheet is going to show is um, all of the change items from base, and this shaded column, um, the yellow column, shows the difference between the House DE amendment and the governor's recommendations. Um, so the first change items are for the legislature. Um, there, you can see the house operating adjustment. This is um, the amount that I believe will be um, presented in the rules committee later today. Several change items for the LCC. The first is operating adjustments that were, um, uh, I understand, calculated in the same way that the house and um, likely the state agencies also did to look um, to cover increases, known increases, insurance, and those sorts of things. Um, there's an increase of 377,000 for the legislative auditor staff. So that's an increase in staff. A base adjustment for the uh, legislative budget office um, because they were facing a base reduction coming into the next um, biennium. There is funding of 370,000 for a diversity and inclusion officer to serve the entire legislature. And then one-time funding for an accessibility vendor to assist the legislature in um, looking at all of the information they post online and making that accessible. Um, and then finally, you'll see, and actually there should be a difference column here. Um, the governor had re recommended transferring the single audit responsibilities from the OLA to Minnesota Management and Budget. And the governor had also recommended a decrease to the OLA. The House Bill DE2 does transfer those functions, but does not cut the um, OLA's funding. So I apologize, there should be a change showing here in the yellow column. And then the final change in the um, legislature's budget is the DE um, does a one-time cancellation of $5 million from the Senate carry forward account. Uh, moving on to the state auditor, you can see all of the um, requested change items were funded um, largely at the requested level with the exception of the school finance accountability team, which was funded at a lower level than the governor of 229,000. So a total of um, $3 million increase for the state auditor. Um, moving down to the attorney general, again, you'll see listed the um, various change items you've um, heard about um, and the Again, the funding is slightly below the governor's and the AG's request of uh, $500,000 less, um, but the total increase in funding would be $11.8 million. For the Secretary of State's office, the total um, increase is $1.85 million. This includes uh, the requested change items for the office and then two member uh, initiatives, first $48,000 in one-time funding for House File 158, that was the voting instructions in non-English languages, and then $500,000 in one-time funding for bilingual grants for bilingual election judges, and that was represent Claiborne's bill. Um, as I go through this, I'm going to just go quickly through, you'll see for most of the small agencies, the only change item they have is a operating adjustment. Um, these percentages will vary a little bit, but the methodology used um, by MMB to calculate these was um, standard, looking at existing um, staff costs within the payroll system, known health care in insurance increases, rent increases, and IT increases. Um, you may see some, I, I'll point out, for example, in the capital area architectural and planning board, there's actually a bigger adjustment um, in the first year, and that's because of a known retirement of a longtime employee with that small agency. And finally, on this page at the bottom um, is the $4.4 million for the minute services um, changes that includes an operating adjustment, but also um, the blue ribbon council recommendations. And um, in a minute, you'll see the first of a, a negative number in the fiscal year 21 column, and that was due to the um, administrative holdbacks 
that the governor and MMB announced earlier um, when, when COVID first started. And so those are, that are reflected as negative um, spending in fiscal year 21. Oh, and I noticed I should jump up to the Secretary of State's office, also a fiscal year 21 change. Um, additional HABA funding of 29,000 from the special revenue fund. And that is because there is language in this bill um, creating a statutory appropriation of the HABA funds. And please let me know if I'm going too slow or too fast. Um, moving on to the next page, uh, just you'll see at the top, there's some language in the bill dealing with the minute cash flow assistance. This is something they've asked for for the last several um, budget cycles. For Department of Administration, the total change is 4.5 million for the biennium. This includes the requested um, change items, including a request to the, an increase to the in lieu of rent, uh, an operating adjustment, um, funding dealing with um, improving equity and grants management and equity and procurement. And then there are two member um, initiatives funded. The first is um, $500,000, this is one-time funding for census, sensory accessibility grants. This was Representative Freiburg's bill. And then in the second year, uh, increase from Representative Frazier's bill, um, an increase in the Ampers grants. Moving on um, for Minnesota management and budget, um, the increase for fiscal year 22-23 is 4.1 million. Um, you can see here, in the fiscal year 21 column, again, that they have a negative um, operating adjustment, um, negative um, expenditures or a reduction in fiscal year 21. And then you'll also see there's a new open general fund um, change item. This is where you'll see the funding for the transfer of the single audit responsibilities from the legislative auditor to the um, to Minnesota management and budget. Um, next is Department of Revenue, which is the largest general fund um, agency in this uh, committee. And so um, you know, their increase for the 22-23 biennium is 9.3 million, but they also do have an $8.3 million reduction in fiscal year 21. So these, this change is um, from both the operating adjustment and then an increase to the base for the volunteer income tax assistance grants. Um, the next several items are all the operating adjustments for the small agencies. Um, and these are all funded at the governor's level. Um, so I won't go through them um, one by one because I think the numbers are all pretty clear. Um, the historical society is, is larger just because of the nature of their um, general fund base is larger. So again, walking through to the next, um, the last sheet, again, all you'll see the small agency adjustments. And then finally, um, some changes for the gambling control board. Uh, these are all from the special revenue fund, not from the general fund, um, but increases for staffing, rent travel, employee development, and then creating and maintaining an information system. And finally, I'll walk you through the, the general fund reconciliation. Um, total uh, changes in Expenditures are uh, 43.1 million, and then you'll see the 2.5 million is from the open general fund for the single audit. So a total of 45.56 million. Um, and then we do have revenue changes that we also um, count in our, against our target or for, for our target. And when you see a revenue, if it's a positive number, that's a gain to the general fund. So You'll see the carry forward cancellation for the Senate of $5 million. Um, there's a loss in revenue to, for the capital complex parking fund shortfall, and then a million dollars from the MMB um, payment plus vendor rebates. And then there are also some revenue changes over in um, fiscal 21 as well that we um, do count. Um, finally, um, there's some non-general fund revenues and transfers that I'm tracking. And at the end, um, you'll see on line 172, this was the base for this committee's um, agencies coming in from the February forecast. And then the $45.56 million in um, increased expenditures. And then we net that out against the um, revenue changes that I discussed, the largest, of course, which is the Senate carry forward reduction. 
which brings the total spending for fiscal year 22-23 to this 990, 9,755,000, um, bringing forward the, the redu spending reductions from fiscal year 21, that reduces this um, net spending for those three years to 994,663,000. So that's a quick walkthrough. Um, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. And now Mr. Gehring. Uh, wait, wait a second, Representative Nash, do we have your hand up? Do you have questions for Ms. Roberts or? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Roberts, could you walk through the cosmetology number again? I, you were scrolling awfully fast, and I wanted to make sure I knew that. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Representative Ms. Roberts. Nash, uh, you'll see on line 126, and I'm sorry, I did go through those, all of those small, small agencies pretty quickly. Um, for the cosmetology examiners board, the general fund increase is $139,000 for the biennium. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Roberts, uh, my apologies for my voice. Uh, uh, I've got really bad allergies today. And uh, could you walk through what, what that's for? Did they detail that in the governor's request? Ms. Roberts. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, there is some discussion of it in each individual change item um, in the governor's budget documents. I also have some additional information from MMB that I can put together. MMB calculated these um, individual operating adjustments for the agencies, and they used a, a standard methodology that looked at, um, I believe they took a snapshot of the current um, staffing costs in the human resources payroll system, and then um, looked at known insurance costs um, some known changes such as known retirements and those kinds of changes um, applied a 1% increase each year uh, for, uh, to cover payroll, payroll increase costs and then um, also included known rent changes and known changes from minute services. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Roberts, if you could get that to me, I would appreciate that. I know I've got it, uh, but you... You've always proven to be faster on the draw than I am on finding those things. Um, I'm mostly interested in uh, their rent and common area maintenance and some of the, the expenditures they have on their, their physical facilities and payroll. Ms. Ms. Roberts will take note of that. Representative um, Nash, are you, are you done then? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Quam, I see you have your hand up. Is it of Ms. Roberts or? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, clarification on the legislative auditor adjustment. Uh, uh, was there any justification given for that adjustment? Or is it just they did the job? Uh, Ms. Roberts, uh, I mean, Representative Quam, you, uh, do you mean that uh, the keeping the, the budget amount that they're transferring over the, the policy or the transferring over the single audit to the lead, to the state auditor or actually to the Department of Administration was gonna uh, contract that out possibly to the state auditor. And then they're, but they're gonna keep the uh, money. Uh, Mr. Nobles, I don't know if he's on the, on this morning, but Mr. Nobles, if he, if, wanted to be able to, to use that, that, those, that, that, those dollars to keep his staff that he currently has so he could do other program audits and things that we requested him. Otherwise he would have had to take a cut, cut staff in, in his office um, as he lost the um, single audit function. Um, does that answer your question, Representative Kwan? Uh Mr. Chair, I mainly wanted it brought up the the fact that uh, that single audit and that activity, federal funds come in, the state is, and agencies are supposed to uh, have controls and audit it. And there's part of those federal funds cover administration, which is the internal auditing. None of those funds were ever utilized to compensate the legislative auditor 
However, that function was still taking out of the bandwidth of which we as a legislature funded the auditor. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I was not pleased that the governor thought that there should be an adjustment. And I'm glad that uh, uh, people in the legislature uh, respect the need and independence of the legislative auditor. And I just wanted to make sure it was, was clear. Thank you, Representative Kwam. Any further questions of Ms. Roberts? If not, we will go to Mr. Gehring. And Mr. Gehring, if you wanna walk through the rest of the bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, so uh, Ms. Roberts walked through Article 1 of the DE2 uh, Amendment, and I'm gonna walk through the policy articles, which are Articles 2 through 6. Um, the policy articles include a general um, state government policy uh, article, as well as elections, campaign finance, information technology, uh, and local government. And instead of walking, uh, sharing my screen with the actual DE amendment, because there are so many pages, I'm just going to share the screen that shows the policy tracking sheet that I have. Um, but I'll give some page references as we as we go through. So I'm happy to take questions um, wherever you have them. Um, so uh, first, uh, we'll start with Article 2, since Article 1 has already been covered. Uh, Article 2 um, starts on page 14 of the DE2 amendment. Um, there's, uh, it starts with a number of small sections. Uh, section 1 on page 14 um, designates a state, state fire museum. Uh, section 2 uh, is language that authorizes the leg legislative reference library to receive uh, state documents at no cost. Section 3 um, clarifies the scope of jurisdiction for the Legislative Coordinating Commission. Um, section, starting in section four, uh, sections four through nine, um, uh, provide a number of administrative and technical updates to the um, scope of work of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. This is the bill um, that was heard previously in committee um, that provides authority for the OLA to conduct special reviews, um, modifies their staffing structure and some other items. Uh, section 10 um, is the first section in a series of sections in this article that provide changes um, to the um, the laws governing the work of the Department of Administration. Um, this is the bill that you heard in committee previously, uh, Representative Carlson's bill that includes things like um, authorizing the handler of a state canine to um, take ownership of the of the canine once it's retired from state service, uh, shifting the Office of the Cla uh, Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution, um, codifying in statute the Office of Enterprise Sustainability, um, some changes and clarifications to the um, SHPO, which is the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, and then a number of um, sort of administrative uh, and technical changes related to the central motor pool. Um, section 12, which you find on page 20 of the DE2 amendment uh, is the language that codifies the executive order related to the uh, state tribal relationships. This was Representative Becker Finn's bill that the committee heard recently. Um, section 13, which is on page 24 of the DE2, um, is the first in a series of uh, policy recommendations that came from the governor's office. Uh, this is the, the policy language that actually moves the single source audit responsibility from the legislative auditor to MMB. Um, you heard the discussion uh, just a minute ago about the way that funding is structured. This is the policy language that goes along with that. Uh, section 14, which is also on page 24 of the DE2, uh, provides a set date for the release of the November budget forecast, which is would be required to be released in, by December 6th of each year. Um, section 15, uh, also on page 24, um, gets rid of some obsolete language related to the, um, the transfer of surplus funds to the Clean Water Fund at the end of, of the biennium. And that's because the, uh, that, fund, the, that amount of fund, funds has now been transferred. And so the language is no longer necessary in that section. Uh, section 16, which is on page 25 of the DE2, um, authorizes the Commissioner of Management and Budget to establish a virtual payments program. This was a governor's policy recommendation. Uh, section 18 uh, on page 26 of the DE2 uh, establishes a capital flag program to provide uh, U.S. and Minnesota state flags to um, families of public safety officers killed in the line of duty, as well as to uh, families of military members who died while in active service. Uh, section 25, this is on page 32 of the DE2, is a governor's policy recommendation that provides that grant funds that are appropriated by law, um, uh, or th that a portion of grant funds um, appropriated by law may be used for administrative costs of it, uh, for the grant by the agency that's administering it. Uh, the amount of the administrative uh, 
allowance is uh, 5% for um, legislatively named and formula grants and 10% for competitive grants. Um, section 26, which on page 33 of the DE2 uh, provides that it's a, um, a, an option rather than a mandate for MMB to provide uh, an option for a high deductible health plan to certain employee groups. Um, on page 39 of the DE2 uh, is the first in a couple of sections that relate to um, uh, background checks for individuals who have access to federal tax information. Um, the substantive um, section there is section 40. Um, on page 39 of the DE2, section 39, uh, you'll see um, is also governor's recommendation. This expands the eligibility uh, for uh, organizations that participate in the um, volunteer income tax assistance grants program. Uh, section 41 on page 41 of the DE2 uh, allows um, members of the Gambling Control Board to remain in their position um, until a successor is appointed. This is Representative uh, uh, Hewitt's bill um, as in introduced. And then moving forward, um, section 44, which is on also on page 44 of the DE2, is the working group to make recommendations for creating a racial equity impact note for, for proposed legislation. This was the bill that you heard from Representative Vang um, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, a note here that this um, section is just the working group and not the substantive uh, requirement of the racial equity impact note um, in this amendment. Uh, section 45, which is also on page 44 of the DE2, uh, provides language providing for um, uh, sensory accessibility accommodations grants, and there's funding that Ms. Roberts mentioned in Article 1 uh, to go along with this. And then the repealers, uh, Section 47 at the end of Article 1, uh, include repealers that go back with um, um, some previous policy sections, as well as the repeal of the employee gain sharing program and the requirement that certain interagency agreements and transfers be reported to the legislature. And Mr. Chair, that's the end of um, the general um, policy article, Article 2. So I'll move on to Article 3, which is the Elections Administration Article. Um, section 1 of that article, which is on page 45, um, provides a permanent statutory appropriation for um, Help America Vote Act funds. As you know, this is um, these are funds that currently are, um, when they're provided to the state by the federal government, require a subsequent legislative appropriation to be used. This would um, get rid of the need for further legislative appropriation. Um, there's a whole uh, slew of sections in Article 3 that come from Representative Nelson's House File 1160. This is the Secretary of State's um, technical and administrative bill. Um, this is, um, across these sections, you'll um, see changes to the time when um, absentee ballots may be counted, uh, elimination of the three-person limit for assisting a voter on election day, uh, extension of the availability of the availability of previously appropriated HAVA funds. So this is not the permanent statutory appropriation. This is um, extending the funds that have been appropriated in the last couple of years. Uh, you also see changes in um, uh, the way that post-election reviews um, are conducted, um, changes in to uh, conform to um, recent litigation related to uh, vacancies and nomination for federal office, um, the process for recounts of constitutional amendments, um, and some other sort of miscellaneous uh, changes um, throughout this article. Um, next, you'll see um, section three of this article um, is the first in a couple of sections that relate to voter intimidation. This is language that comes from Representative Greenman's House File 9. Um, section three is, is um, authorizing the Attorney General to enforce the new laws, but the substantive new voter intimidation sections are sections 80 and 81, which come quite a bit later in, uh, in the article. Uh, section four, again, is um, the first of a few sections that establish a process of automatic voter registration. This is on page 54 of the DE2 um, amendment. Uh, section five, which is on page 47 of the DE2, um, requires post-secondary institutions that enroll students that accept state financial aid to prepare, prepare a current list of students enrolled in campus, in campus housing, as well as within 10 miles of campus. Um, this list is used for uh, same-day voter registration for proof of residence. Um, section six on page 47 of the DE2 is the first in a series of sections that restore voting rights to individuals um, following any period of incarceration after uh, conviction for a felony. Um, section 20, which is on page, um, which follows the section, um, is the first of two sections that come from Representative Long's bill that authorize political parties to enforce the use of their name on the ballot through the errors and omissions petition process. Um, section 28 
um, which you'll see on page 63 of the DE2, um, requires the Secretary of State to prepare, prepare voting instructions in languages other than English for in-person absentee voters. Uh, there's an appropriation that goes along with this that Ms. Roberts mentioned in Article 1. Um, section 36 on page 68 of the DE2 um, authorizes a candidate to request that their residential address um, be protected from public disclosure if they have a reasonable fear uh, for their own safety or the safety of their family. Um, sections 42 and 43 on page 72 of the DE2 uh, authorize school boards to grant academic credit uh, to students serving as trainee election judges. Um, and also when possible to recruit bilingual high school students to serve as trainee judges. And there's um, uh, language provided or an appropriation provided in Article 1 um, to support recruitment of these um, types of trainee judges. Um, section 75 on page 90 of the DE2 is new language that authorizes the Secretary of State to distribute um, HAVA funds as grants to political subdivisions for certain uh, purposes which are authorized under the um, Help America Vote Act, uh, the federal law. Um, and then lastly, in the uh, Elections Administration article, um, I have lost my page. There we go. Uh, lastly, um, Section 92, which is on page 101 of the DE2, uh, is language from Representative Dabney's um, House Hall 23 that directs the Secretary of State uh, to adopt an administrative rule that recognizes a medical bill as proof of res residence for purposes of Election Day registration. Uh, and that's the end of the elections and administra administration article. Um, article four is campaign finance. Um, starting on page 123 of the DE2, you'll see sections one through section one running through section nine. And then um, throughout this article, uh, as Representative Freiberg's House File 396, which transfers oversight of certain campaign finance uh, reporting requirements for candidates located in Hennepin County. On page 103, um, section six of this article, it comes from Representative Greenman's bill. This expands the definition of expressly advocating. Um, this is a term that's used to um, decide whether um, a campaign um, uh, advertisement or other document is required to be reported to the campaign finance board. Um, section 10 on page 104 of the DE2 is Representative Lucero's uh, language that authorizes um, uh, certain security related expenses to be reported as a non campaign disbursement when paid for by uh, campaign funds. Um, on page 107 of the DE2 is the first um, of a series of sections that come from um, House File 1803. This is Representative Hur's bill that pr um, provides sort of miscellaneous and technical updates to uh, campaign finance board laws, including the way that uh, savings of economic interest are reported. Um, section 31 on page 121 of the DE2 um, is language that requires independent expenditure disclaimers to list the top three contributors responsible for funding that disclaimer. And then lastly, in this article, um, sections 32 and 33, there's on a, a page 122 of the DE2, uh, eliminates, um, it, it sort of restructures and reorganizes the requirement related to um, the disclaimer that's required re reported on electronic communication. So these are things like um, online banner ads and other types of um, um, advertisements like that. And that's the end of Article 4 with the campaign finance article. So next is Article 5, uh, which is a um, relatively short article uh, related to information technology policy. Um, section 1 on page 125 um, establishes the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity. This is um, Representative Bonner's Health File 66. And then most of the rest of this article uh, is um, also represented Bonner's bill, House File 609, uh, that provides a number of um, changes related to the structure and um, oversight of the Office of Minute Services, um, including changing the name of Minute from the Office of Minute Services to the Department of Information Technology Services. Um, these sections also reorganize the existing Technology Advisory Committee uh, to, extent, to instead call it the Technology Advisory Council and expands its membership to more closely mirror the current um, Blue Ribbon Council on IT Services. Um, and I would say otherwise uh, in the, the series of sections, you see um, some recommendations that come from that Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, as well as some recommendations made by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. And then in Article 6, um, which follows is um, Chelsea Griffin's uh, area. She's our local government analyst. And I believe she's on the call to do the walkthrough of that article. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Chelsea Griffin, and I'm with House Research. So I'll be walking you through the provisions of Article 6 in the DE. 
The sections one through six update various provisions of the open meeting law to reflect modern technology that's used for remote meetings of public bodies. Uh, section seven, beginning on page 143, authorizes cities of the first class to enact an ordinance that requires a portion of land to be dedicated to the public or to impose a dedication fee for such purposes on new construction. Um, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul already have special legislation like this. And so sections 21 through 22 um, amend those special laws to be notwithstanding the new language in section seven. Section eight authorizes the CUA Port Authority of Duluth to create a nonprofit corporation under chapter 317A. Section nine and 10, uh, which you can find on page 144, authorizes towns or any political subdivision of the state with statutory sewer ownership or operational responsibilities to establish inflow and infiltration prevention programs. Section 11, also found on page 144, um, increases the threshold for certain county contracts to $750,000. Section 12 on page 144 permits a city or town to adopt a, an ordinance requiring hotels in the municipality to have a municipal hotel license, which requires compliance with state and local laws. Section 13 on page 145 is a conforming change in reaction to the repealer, uh, which is section 23 on page 152. Um, the repealer repeals the compensation limit for political subdivision employees. And finally, sections 14 through 20, which are on pages uh, 145 through 151, update uh, various uh, special law provisions that authorize the Duluth Entertainment and Convention Center. Um, these provisions generally update language and it increases, increases the threshold for required competitive bidding or required deck authorizations of contracts to more than $50,000. Mr. Chair, that concludes Article 6 and the bill. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Um, members, any questions? If not any questions, uh, um, we have some people on the line here to give te a testimony. Um, I guess the first one, I, I've got a list here. I don't know if this is the way we're going to go. We want to go, but Commissioner Alice Roberts Davis, um, you want to testify? Doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like she's there. Um, the next person I have is uh, uh, Julie Byer, Byerly. Not hearing from her, not hearing from her. Um, Commissioner Doty from the uh, Department of Revenue. Good morning, Chair Nelson. Good morning, Commissioner Doty. Well, Chair Nelson, members of the committee, thank you, thank you for having me today. For the record, my name is Robert Doty, Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. We appreciate the committee's efforts in House File 1952 to support the governor's recommendations, and we thank you for your support of the department. As you know, the IRS and Minnesota opened the 2021 individual income tax filing season on February 12th. As previously announced, the Department of Revenue is extending a grace period to Minnesota taxpayers who will have the opportunity to file and pay their taxes penalty and interest-free until May 17th. As of Monday, the department had received 1.5 million individual income tax returns, processed nearly 1.4 million returns, and sent out about 971,000 refunds. The governor's recommendations reflected the funding necessary to sustain our current operations and our agency commitment to identifying efficiencies to manage ongoing cost growth related to compensation, IT services, and other agency operating expenses. As changes are made to the tax code, revenue will need increased funds to administer these changes to our current service levels. 
any reduction from the governor's recommendations will begin to affect the delivery of programs and services. That could translate to longer wait times for Minnesotans calling with questions or longer wait times for refunds to be processed. As this bill moves forward, we hope the committee will provide the full operating adjustment Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan proposed in their budget. I would like to thank you for providing the governor's recommendation for grants for taxpayer assistance. We are concerned about the lack of direct appropriation language for capacity building. Providing an appropriation for capacity building would enable the department to provide resources and tools for new and expanding VITA sites across the state. To close, I would like to thank you for your support of the, de of the Department of Revenue and for including compliance provisions to align Minnesota to IRS Publication 1075. We are eager to serve Minnesota taxpayers as efficiently and as effectively as possible. To do so, we need your help to secure the appropriate level of financial resources that will enable the department to continue the need to meet the needs of Minnesota's taxpayers. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for letting me speak to you today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Doty. Um, the next person I have on the list is Andrea Furston. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the House Government and Finance Committee. I am Andrea Furstan. I'm with the Center for Economic Conclusion, and I want to thank members of this committee for including the formation of a working group to design the racial equity impact notes, methodology, and process. Only the full economic participation of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian people will unlock our region and state's potential for growth. To this end, I want to encourage this committee to include direction that ensures enactment of the racial equity impact notes begins next session. There is adequate time for the working group to provide recommendations and for the LBO to review these and put in place an execution plan for delivery of these notes next session. Racial equity impact notes are critical to unlocking our state's potential as it ensures key data and analysis be part of the decision making process. I want to remind members of this committee of my colleague Brett Grant's testimony recently, in which he noted that many racially and economically inequitable results are produced inadvertently through processes and choices that may not even explicitly address race, may appear race neutral, or may even be offered to address, raci to address racial disparities because we do not have a process in place to assess the intended results. As our demographic shifts, our disparities persist. With federal dollars coming into the state at unprecedented levels, we must work in a timely manner to ensure data-informed decision-making that helps us better assess future impact of legislation and spending. The Center for Economic Inclusion, Voices for Racial Justice, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota, and the Racial Equity and Joy Coalition all recommend instituting racial equity and back notes as a means for ensuring responsive policies and investments. We can't afford to wait on the implementation of racial equity impact notes. This can serve as a vital tool for preventing institutional racism and for identifying new options to remedy longstanding inequities and accelerate inclusive growth, prosperity, and resilience. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Furston. Um, members, I see Representative Kosnick, you have your hand up. I, Representative New, I saw your hand up. Did you take it down? Is your Representative New. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I did. My question was actually for Commissioner Doty. Okay, well, um, well, go ahead and ask your question, Mr. Representative, or Commissioner Doty is still here. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Doty, I'm just wondering if you can let us know with the reduction from the governor's recommendations, is that going to lead to any layoffs at the department? Commissioner Doty. Is he still here? I don't see him actually. I thought he was going to stay for questions. Um, okay, looks like we lost him. Looks like we lost him. Yes. Um, so. We'll we'll get that question to him, and maybe he'll be be here tomorrow to answer questions. Also, uh, Representative Kosnick, you had a question. Uh, I was curious in uh, Commissioner Doty's answer as well. So the same question. Okay. Well. We'll get, the, we'll get that to him. Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was 
wanting to ask a question of Ms. Furston. Go ahead, Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Furston, I heard you talk about several uh, minority groups. Uh, I did not hear the Council on uh, Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Was that uh, an oversight by yourself or or what? Ms. Furston. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Nash. I know that when we talk about the working group, there are a number of groups that are being explored and mentioned. And um, and I believe Cal um, Council of Asian and Pacific Americans is uh, one of them. Um, I, we'd have to double check that, but that's certainly uh, a key partner that we can look at in terms of the working group. And Mr. Chair, I, I, Ms. Furston broke up that they are or are not included. Uh, Ms. First, I believe you said they are. I believe, but I'd have to double check the language in the working group. But if they are not, that is something that we could certainly look at. And there are some spots that are to be appointed. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Nash, that that working group comes out of Representative Vang's um, bill that we put forward, and and we're doing the working group so that they can come forward with recommendations to us and to the governor of changes we need to make. And then hopefully next year, we'll be able to make those changes and institute the, the racial impact notes across the board for all, all the minority groups. Um, members, any other questions? Seeing none, um, members, um, that, that gets us through our walkthrough. And, and I, I've got a note here that Ms. Ms. Roberts Doty, or Ms. Roberts Davis um, is gonna testify, are gonna testify tomorrow. We may have more testifiers tomorrow. Um, uh, amendments to the, to the DE amendment are due five o'clock today. Um, and so that we can then we'll get through the testimony and start working on tomorrow on the, the markup of the bill. We've got tomorrow evening scheduled to finish markup of the bill. And, um, and if we finish that, we can pass the bill out or we can come back. We'll be back here Thursday morning, again, doing the walk, the markup of the bill and or um, and passing the bill out of here to Ways and Means. Uh, by Thursday, the latest of this at 10 o'clock, this bill will be passed out to Ways and Means. We also tomorrow morning have a presentation from the represent from the majority leader Ryan Winkler and Barb Julik, the controller of the House budget to explain the changes of the House budget and going moving forward. And that's again that's part of the bill, but they'll explain what those are. They'll be that's going to be taken up in rules today. Um, members, any further questions? If not members, um, Have a, I'll just say have a good day. You, you know what's ahead of us for the next couple of days. This is the, the hard work of this committee and we will hopefully get this bill passed out into ways and means and, uh, um, and then go on from there. So members with that, there are no further questions or comments. Um, we are adjourned for today. Thank you members.